Dismissed if you're still in here, children. Head to Children's Church. Some of you left already. It's our offering time. I wanted to acknowledge the women, and some of you uh, brought uh, different hygiene gifts for the Salvation Army. And so thank you for participating in that. They put together 47 of these nice uh, packets of hygiene kits that will be given to uh, one of the leaders at the Salvation Army and given to those who come to their facility. And so thank you for your generosity in that. On the back wall, there's an offering box for those of you that bring your, your general gifts and tithes. Thank you for your generous giving to the church. It's a blessing. Psalm 118 calls us to praise him. Hosanna in the highest. And the people on Palm Sunday, they quoted that psalm and they sang it at the feet of Jesus. And so today, we're going to look at that story. I wonder what your story is and whether you would testify to who Jesus is and what he's done in your life. I hope you have a story and I hope you're willing to testify to what he's done. On, psalm, uh, or in, on Palm Sunday, uh, John chapter 12 we read about what was happening just before that, just before the, this holy week that we enter into today and, and throughout the week. Last week, we sang a song that said, Christ be magnified in me. And so what does that look like? How would Christ be magnified in our lives? And so I'll give you the why first, and then I'll give you the how. The why is because he's worthy. He is so worthy of any of our praise and the way in which we honor him and the way in which we worship him the way in which we study his word, the way in which we follow him, he's worthy. The second why is because people need that. People need the rescuing deliverance of Jesus Christ. People need what you have. People need to know what you have received from him because there's a lot of hurting people in the world and they need the joy of the Lord. They need to know there's more to it than just going through the motions. And a lot of people will go through the motions this week, this Easter week. And how powerful it would be if they heard your testimony, saw your testimony, that Jesus is worthy to be praised and what he's done in your life. So that's the why. But the how is, how are we going to honor him? How are we going to magnify him? And in this story today, and you can get the fullness of it, it's a, it's a Friday family feast. It's a... They all come together. I call it on Friday because that's how I study it. There's other scholars who say this feast took place on Saturday, and uh, they came together. Lazarus was there. Other people were there. And so they try to look through the timing of it, of when this took place. They came from, the Scripture says, from Jericho, and they went to Bethany, and Bethany was just two miles out from Jerusalem. It would have been a long walk, a full day, from Jericho to Jerusalem, from Jericho to Bethany, And in between, there's not much there. That's the parable that Jesus told about uh, the Good Samaritan, that road. It's a desert road. It's a road that's troubling. It's a road where people would get robbed. And so you would need a full day. And so my belief is they wouldn't have done that on Saturday because Saturday is the Sabbath. And so they would have done it on Friday, gotten up early, and gotten to Bethany where a meal was already being prepared. And what a meal it was. What a meal was going on. What a feast. And then Saturday was the day of rest because the Scripture says those who believe it on Saturday, the scholars who look at Saturday say, well, it says, and then the next day, the next day they went to uh, the the triumphal entry. They went to Jerusalem. But they're not taking into account, I don't think, the aspect of how they, on the Sabbath, they just shut down. They don't go to the grocery store. They don't go watch a football game. They don't, they, they just, they, they rest. And the next day would have been Palm Sunday, and what a great day. I love Palm Sunday. And so in chapter 11, we hear about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And he told his disciples in verse 14 of chapter 11, told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. He's not just asleep, and he's not just sick anymore. He's actually dead. And for your sake, I'm glad I was not there. Because if he would have been there, he would have healed him from his sickness. But for your sake... I'm glad I was not there because now he's dead. And now that you may believe, we're going to him so that you may believe. That's the whole purpose of John's letter. He says it time and time after again. So that you would believe who Jesus said he is. And you would believe he is life and he is resurrection. And then in verse 55 of chapter 11, we get the setting. Here's what's happening. 
when it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, many went up from the countries to Jerusalem for their ceremonial cleansing before the Passover. Because it was a long journey, because it was a, a dirty journey to get to Jerusalem, they would need to have a ceremonial cleansing, and they would have what's referred to, we call baptism mikvah, and lots of different mikvahs, baptism uh, areas of water, where they would be cleansed before the Passover to get ready. And if you had, had uh, touched or been near a dead body, you had seven days to prepare yourself to be cleansed. Well, Lazarus was dead, and there were a lot of people that were there, and a lot of hugs from a dead man who rose from the dead and was now alive. And so there would have been a lot of questions and cleansing and things needing to take place. And people left early to get to Jerusalem for that festival week, Passover. They kept looking for Jesus, and as they stood in the temple courts, they asked one another, what do you think? Is he coming or isn't he? Is he coming to this festival, this Passover? We've seen him at other ones. Is he coming? And the chief priests and the Pharisees had given orders that anyone who found out where Jesus was, they should report it so that they could arrest him. That was their plan. So lots of different plans going on here. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany. That's where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. What a day. What a dinner. We're going to have a couple of dinners uh, coming up. One this week on Friday. We'll have a light supper here. And then we'll use that table to enter into a time of communion, to receive the elements, the Last Supper, and then we'll reflect and remember the great sacrifice of Jesus going to the cross for us. And so that will be a meal here and here, and we'll sit at tables. And what if somebody came in from the road? What if so you invited somebody to come, and what would you say? What is this about? What is this dinner? Because that's what's happening here. All kinds of onlookers, all kinds of people, curious, wondering <coughs> what this dinner party was all about. And when they had dinner parties, people just showed up. They, just, they were all kinds of party crashers. They would just show up and, and see what's happening. And this was a dinner party you wouldn't want to miss. And then we have another dinner coming up on uh, April 10th. It's a Wednesday, and we're going to celebrate the obstacles removed commitments that people bring. And uh, Divine Swine is going to come, and they're going to bring their good stuff and cater it for us. So we just get to enjoy and celebrate and hear the testimonies of what God has done. <coughs> so that's a couple meals. But let me talk about this one here in John 12. Who do you think might have been there? We don't have all of the, all of the details. And so sometimes when you really want to study an event that you've heard year after year, you come to this service, Palm Sunday, you get something like the Gospel Parallels. It takes the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because they tell the basic story of Jesus Christ. They start at different places, baptism, temptation, birth, and then they give their perspective on it. They don't give all the details. And so you bring all three of them together, and then you throw John, a personal testimony of the one who was right there with him, and you get a fuller picture of what was taking place. And when you study them all, you find out that they were, before this, <coughs> before raising Lazarus from the dead, or after Lazarus, where were they? They were in Bethany, and then where did they go? And you find out that they were in Jericho. Well, what happened in Jericho? Anybody know what happened in Jericho when Jesus day? Anybody know what happened? You can shout it out loud. You don't have to whisper it to somebody. Zacchaeus, that wee little man, he was in a tree, and he was wanting to see Jesus, and Jesus came to him and said, I'm coming to your house to eat. Another dinner. Jesus loved to eat. Hang out with people relationally, and so they went to Zacchaeus, and that day, Zacchaeus went from being lost to being found. Well, it was a good day. And on that road in Jericho, there were a couple of blind men that were calling out and said, uh, Son of David, help, have mercy on us. They were singing Palm Sunday way before, way too early. Save us. That's what Hosanna means. Lord, save us. And he says, what do you want me to do? Have mercy on us. We want to have our sight. And one of the guys' name was Bart. Bartimaeus for sure, or, or for long. And so blind Bartimaeus got healed that day and was able to see. He was there. And then they go from Jericho. Did Zacchaeus go with them? I don't know. Did Bartimaeus go with them? I don't know. But I think maybe, because most of them would have wanted to celebrate the Passover. And if Jesus was walking that path and others were going, let's go with him and let's testify to what he's done. Zacchaeus, I was lost and now I'm found. 
I was caught up in sin, and now I've been saved. Blind Bartimaeus. I was blind, and now I see. All these powerful testimonies. And it says they went to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, and there was another man that lived there, <coughs> who I think was hosting the dinner party. That's why they pointed out it wasn't Lazarus' house. He was there. If it was, if it was his house, they wouldn't have needed to say it. It was that Lazarus' house. But he was there with them. And Martha served. And so she was there serving. And if you look at the other gospel accounts, you find that there was this account of the anointing of Jesus' feet at Simon's house. And there were two of them. In this account, Simon the leper, who was a leper, was healed. And he's having a party. And so I believe it was at Simon the leper's house. In Luke, he gives an account of a different anointing. It says a sinful woman came into Simon the Pharisee house, that Simon the Pharisee had a party for Jesus. And she, a sinful woman, possibly a prostitute, had come in and wiped his feet with perfume and with her tears, washed them with her tears, and then wiped it with her hair. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's a different account. <clears throat> but it teaches us something in there. And he said, Jesus said to Simon the Pharisee, listen, I did a long walk here. I came to your house. Nobody offered to wipe my feet. Nobody took care of me. This woman has not stopped washing my feet with her tears since I came. To whom has been forgiven much, rejoices and loves much. And she just pours out her honor and worship on Jesus. That's a different account. This is now Simon the leper's house. Lots of bystanders who followed on the road. Jesus again walking. If they did leave on Friday morning, a long day. Martha already preparing the dinner, already getting it ready. Mary getting ready to do her thing. Lazarus being right there with them. All kinds of curious bystanders looking in on the dinner. Faithful followers, we can see in here that they continued to follow since Lazarus was raised. Look at verse 17 of chapter 12. There was this crowd that was with him, it was with Jesus, when he had called Lazarus from the tomb and had raised him from the dead. And they continued to spread the word. They were at a funeral, and they kept following Jesus, and they go, he raised Lazarus from the dead. I was there. I witnessed it. I'm testifying to it. And so all these faithful followers, there were some skeptics trying to figure it out, curious people, is he coming, what's happening? And there were other people who wanted to take his life. But there were people testifying to the miracles in their life, and Lazarus was one of them. Lord, help us to hear these testimonies fresh and new today. We maybe have heard them years and years and years. Give us something new. Give us a way in which we can learn how to honor you during this holy week, to not just go through the emotions, not just be a curious bystander, but be someone who truly lifts up your name, Jesus, this week whether we take time in quiet to worship you, whether we take time to study your word, whether we serve other people, whatever it may be, may it be for your honor and for your glory. And so teach us through your word today. In Jesus' name I pray. <coughs> the first witness I want you to see in this house of witnesses, so many testimonies. It would have been a long dinner if everybody shared what Jesus did for them that day. I wanted to just focus on three, but there's one that I'm just going to throw in there too, a fourth one, because I just, I, I, didn't wanna, I just couldn't leave her out, and so I might just go a minute or two long today. But we give resurrection uh, testimonies, and we're living proof of who Jesus is when we honor him, when we testify him. And so Lazarus is our first example. The example of Lazarus, I read some of it, six days before the Passover, verse 1, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived. It was his home whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And here a dinner was given in honor of Jesus, not in honor of Lazarus, but Lazarus had a seat of honor because he was sitting next to, he says, he was reclining at the table with him. And so they would have had lots of tables, tables about that height maybe. They would have been sitting at him. And so you put your feet away from the food. You don't put your feet on people's tables at your house, right? And you don't put your feet up like this where the food is. And so they would have been reclining like this, eating their food, and it says Lazarus was right next to him. It was right next to Jesus. And that's a very cool picture, and it's going to become even just a, a greater picture in just a minute when we see what Mary does. And so they're reclining at the table. Would have been a table of four or five here. 
another table over here, maybe six, would have been a kid's table on the roof, and there would have been all kinds of people there trying to get in. Lazarus was at the table next to Jesus because he was testifying that day that he was dead and now he's alive. And so we see what is happening with Lazarus' testimony. Lazarus testified to Jesus that he was the victorious deliverer uh, deliverer over death, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And so he goes to Lazarus and Mary and Martha's house, just uh, friends of his, spend time with them before going to Jerusalem. What does Lazarus do? We don't know. We, we just see that he's there. We don't really learn a lot about his personality. I want to know more about his personality. I told you last week that I think that he would have kept some of his grave cloth. <laughs> when... <coughs> When you died in Jesus' day, they would anoint a body uh, with an oil or uh, some type of balming, and then they would wrap them, wrap the bodies. And there was a special uh, cloth for the face, but then there was grave clothes that just wrapped the body. And I believe that Lazarus would have saved some of that, just in case. Not because he would forget, because you don't forget when you've been dead and now you're alive. I I can't say from experience, but I'm just pretty sure of that one there. I'm like 100% sure of that one. You don't forget if you were dead and now you're alive. And so Lazarus maybe had a little bit of, if it were me, if that had happened to me, I would have definitely worn it like this. I would have worn it just as obnoxious as possible. What's that on your head? Oh, this? Oh, you didn't hear? I was dead. (laughs) I'm alive. And I would have told the story. Lazarus, you know, he might have, if he was buff, he might have wore it up here or something like that, you know, on an armband. I think he probably, just looking at his personality, he probably just tucked it in his belt. Probably just had a little bit right there. And Lazarus, next to Jesus, and they would say, Lazarus, come on, tell us a story. You were dead. What was that like, being dead? Was it dark? Was it just totally quiet? Did you see a light? What, what, was it like a near-death experience? He's like, no, I was, I was dead. <laughs> I was sick, really sick. I was hoping Jesus would come, and then I don't remember anything after that. And then it was dark, and it was really quiet, and something broke through the silence. Lazarus, come forth. What a day. And I was awake, and I came out. End of story. I don't know what else to say. And then he'd sit down, and he would just point, ask him. He was there. He did it. And that's what a testimony is. You tell what you know. What happened to you? I was dead. This is my testimony. I was dead, and now I'm alive. Now point to Jesus. Tell your story, what Jesus did in your life, and then point to him. Sit down and point to him. Half the battle, they say, is showing up, right? Right? I don't know if I agree with that or not, but show up anyways. Whether it's 10%, 20%, 50%, it's not 100%. Show up. Stand up for Jesus. Speak of the victory that he's given you in your life. Then sit down and just point to Jesus. We all have one. We all have a story. We all have a testimony. We all have something that was a rag in our life. This is my testimony from death to life, from sickness to salvation, from the tomb to the table. Are you going to sit at a table this week with Jesus? Are you going to spend any time with him and just reflect on his sacrifice for you? You are his, and he can be yours if you accept him into your life. He came for you. They came, he says, not only because of Jesus in verse 9, A large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there at Bethany and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. And so the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the the Jews were turning, were going over to Jesus. They were repenting, and they were turning to Jesus, and they were putting their faith in Jesus. And so because of his testimony, people were following Jesus. Jesus. They didn't become followers of Lazarus. So don't let your testimony be so much about you that people worship you or or think that you're something special or whatever. Let your testimony just speak to Jesus. And I think one of the reasons why people don't share their testimony as much, one reason is we we weren't dead, right? 
We weren't physically dead. And so we like, oh, i got to have this, this uh, incredible testimony that I was dead, and I was this drug addict, and I was a gang member, and I did all this, and now I've been changed. Listen, your testimony matters. Jesus changed you in some way. Jesus met you in some way. Jesus called your name at some point. Your testimony matters. It doesn't matter what, uh, how dramatic it is or anything. It's your testimony, and nobody can argue with it. You just say, I was blind, and now I see. I was dead, and now I'm alive. I was lost, and now I'm found. It doesn't even need to be long. But one of the other reasons we don't share our testimony is we don't think it's maybe dramatic enough or whatever is because we don't like to point to the rags. We don't like to point to the grave cloth in our own life. We don't like to say, this <coughs> sin of mine this selfishness of mine, this way in which I live my life, this bondage, I don't like to point to it. It's a rag in my life. But Jesus took that rag and he gave you riches. He gave you blessing. He gave you something new. And so talk about the rag. Don't worry about what people might think about your past life. Let it be a testimony to what Jesus changed in you. And so Carry the rag around sometimes and let people know what Jesus did in your life. Show up. Stand up and speak up for Jesus. It's not as easy as it sounds just showing up. Because the chief priest, it says, made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, Jews were going to Jesus. And so now a target is on Lazarus' back. And sometimes that will happen to you. You speak up for Jesus and people will laugh at you. People might persecute you. People might criticize you. People laughed at me when I accepted Christ and put in my life as a high school student. My nickname was Putt. Hey, Putt, how are you doing? How are you doing with Jesus today? And they'd mock me. How's, how are you and Jesus doing today? And I said, good. We're good. How about you? <laughs> and they just kind of walk away from it. They mock me. It's okay. They didn't know what to do with a changed person in their midst. And so what about you? You maybe get persecuted. Lazarus went from being dead to being alive to having people want to kill him because his testimony pointed to Jesus. So sometimes when you stand up for Jesus, and I hope you will, you just say, hey, someone starts using Jesus' name in a terrible way, cursing it, throwing it in the ground, stomping on it. You say, yeah, that's my, that's my Jesus. That's my Lord. I worship him. What? Don't make a big deal of it. Just lift up the name of Jesus. Are oh, you going to church? Oh, you're a church person. You're a religious person, huh? Yep. I love Jesus. Man, he did so, so much for me. Just point to him. Tell your testimony. Stand up for him. It's not as easy as it sounds, is it? At work, you may get in trouble for standing up for Jesus. At school, you may get persecuted. You may get ridiculed. You may get criticized like Mary's about to be criticized. Ask Peter how hard it is to stand up for Jesus. Ask Peter, who John brought into the courtyard and who people saw as one of Jesus' followers, and then a, a young girl says, hey, you're one of his followers. He says, no, not me, not me, because he was afraid. He couldn't stand up and speak up for Jesus. He will later, and he will give his life for him. But at that point, it was hard to stand for Jesus, and he denied him three times. So ask him how hard it is to stand alongside Jesus when people are trying to take your life. It's not easy. That's my point. But you have a testimony. Stand up for him. Don't shy away from an opportunity to point to Jesus. Speak of the victory that he's given you in your life. And if that means pointing to rags first, point to the rags. But don't get... Make sure you spread the, the word about the riches that you have in Christ. So he is our main testimony at this dinner, but something else is going to happen. And so we move from Lazarus to Martha. I just want to do this real quickly. I didn't have this in the original message when I was preparing it, and so if you saw your outline, it was only three. Today there's four. Because I can't leave Martha out. Because at the table, Martha was prepared to serve. So... Lazarus' example was show up, stand up, speak up, whatever S you want to use there. Speak for Jesus. Martha has this example of serving. It's just two words. Here a dinner was given to Jesus, honor, and Martha served. And she gets criticized for it. 
that the other story where Martha was serving and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet and learning from him and learning all the teaching, it's like, oh, Martha, you're just a doer. You just do, 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 do. When are you going to worship? When are you going to honor Jesus? She honored Jesus by her service. She honored Jesus by taking care of other people. She honored Jesus by preparing that meal and serving that meal. She was in the background. She was in the kitchen. She was at the table serving. She was ready. All They went on a long journey, and she had it all set up for them. That's Martha. Man, she served. You could might serve this week. Lots of things going on this week, different events. Bible studies. People are serving. People are teaching. People are sitting at Jesus' feet. Wednesday night. Uh, oh, and the worship's going to be preparing, and they're going to be working, and then the youth are going to be meeting here. Some of the leaders, they serve every week with the youth. And then on Saturday, there's going to be a whole group of people trying to serve the Lord by putting out eggs out on the property. And maybe there'll be snow, and they'll have to get the snowblower out and make it happen. They're going to serve. They're going to continue to serve so that people hear the refreshing message of Jesus Christ. That's why they serve. That's why the worship team serves. That's why the youth leaders serve. That's why the children's ministry people serve. That's why somebody's in the nursery right now. They serve because they want you to have an opportunity to hear about Jesus. Don't dismiss Martha because she's a doer. She honored Jesus by serving. We have two Easter services this year. First time ever. I love our very first Easter service here. I'll never forget it. Over 400 people packed in here. I have no idea how. Just packed. Love the fullness of it. But every year, I always was concerned about the uh, Easter service because there were always people that had to work in the nursery or the children's ministry or whatever, and they missed Easter resurrection worship service. We don't have to have that this year. You can serve one and attend one. You can invite somebody to one. You can serve one. And so we'll have people serving on that morning. It's going to be a great day. And it only happens because people are willing to serve. But Martha, she has a testimony. Don't miss her testimony. She's like a multitasker. She could serve and do this, and then someone say, Hey, Martha, what, didn't you talk to Jesus about this whole resurrection thing? Oh, you want to hear? This is my testimony. I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask, Jesus. I know my brother will rise again in the resurrection at the last day, for brother was dead. I know you are the resurrection and the life. What a powerful testimony. She's just one-on-one with Jesus, asking him why the suffering, why the difficulty, why didn't he make it on time, why did her brother have to die, and she's just coming to him with her questions, and then she just points to what she knows. You know something. You've read it in the Word. You've studied it. You look at it. You know it. Speak it. I know, Jesus, that whatever you ask, if you ask God for it, if I ask in your name and you ask God for it, it will happen. I know that even now my brother will not stay in that tomb. He will be raised, she said, at the last day. I know that. She was one of the first ones to be the 100%. 100%, I know who you are, Jesus. I know what you can do. And I know that you are the resurrection and the life. That's a powerful testimony. And then she went to go start the dishes. And Jesus' words were echoed. Because of her testimony, because of her saying, I know, and then say, by the way, there's the proof, my brother is (laughs) alive. And she walks away. And Jesus reiterates, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I believe. So Lazarus rose up to testify. Martha was in the background serving. And Mary bows down in humility and worship. Let's look at Mary real quick. Verse 3, Mary took about a pint or of pure nard. Spike nard is what it's referred to when you look at the different... Uh, it's from India. It uh, would have been in a, in a fancy bottle, a big bottle, 12 ounces, a pound, one of the gospel writers said, would have been in a fancy bottle. You would have been very expensive. Most people would have just bought an ounce of it and said, let me just buy an ounce because I can't afford all that. Tom, or uh, what's his name, Judas, was really upset about it. And she takes this perfume, this costly anointing oil, <coughs> an expensive perfume, 
She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. Not cool. Not acceptable for a woman to take off her head covering in that day and to actually, so Jesus, remember how he's sitting, reclining at the table, feet there. She comes up behind him, and he would have already taken his shoes off at the door. It was a good thing. You know, they walked in the dirty thing. They probably would have washed it. And Mark tells us she put it on his head. John doesn't give us that detail, but Mark says she anointed his head with the oil, and she anointed his feet, and then she took off her head covering. Oh, I hope you get this, because it's, it's dramatic. How many of you have been to a dinner theater? Anyone been to a dinner theater? You eat and you watch the show and everything like that? This is like the climax of the dinner theater. This is like the peak. Lazarus gives his testimony, I was dead. I'm alive. Pinch me. Martha's serving. You get all the good food. And then Mary comes with this anointing oil. Judas, the betrayer, one of his best friends. Oh, why didn't we sell that? Why didn't we give that to the poor? Come on, why didn't we? And it tells us why. He was upset about it. Not because he cared about the poor, but because he kept the treasury bag. And if it had been sold, he says like almost a year's worth of wages. He could have dipped into it. This one is from uh, Bath and Body Works. It's called Ocean. It's Ultra Shea Body Cream. Oh, it's so good. I'm not much of a lotion guy, but this smells like the ocean. And so she would have poured it and put it on his head. It smells. I feel like I'm in the ocean right now. And the whole room filled up. And she, then she wiped and poured it on his feet. And she takes her head covering or some other cloth, and she wipes his feet. And she takes her hair out, and she wipes his feet. And they're criticizing Judas, saying, why this, why that? And the whole room smells like it. My mom would have freaked out. My mom passed away a few years ago, but she had this perfume allergy thing, and she let you know. If you come to church, some of you probably, she probably offended some of you. Don't wear that perfume. Don't wear that. She got in trouble at work all the time. Don't wear that perfume to work. And so she was very outspoken. (laughs) This room would have been filled with the smell and the sacrifice and expensive. What will we pay? What will it cost us to worship Jesus like Mary? What if she was our example? There's another account in Luke, so I think I mentioned to you, where a prostitute, that's Luke 7, it's a different thing. But Mary goes beyond this cultural norm of a day, looks past the stairs of unbelief, like they would have looked at it and they'd go, that's a big bottle of ointment. That's a lot of spikenard. Maybe she had it because she had anointed her brother's body a few days earlier. Maybe she already had some. Maybe she was one of the best students who sat at Jesus' feet, remember? Sat at Jesus' feet, listened to his teaching, and she knew that he was about to die. She knew he was going to give his life because the disciples were still confused about it. But what does Jesus say? What are the words of Jesus? This, do not criticize her. Do not come at her. It was intended that she would save this perfume for the day of my burial. This perfume, this anointment was prepared for my death. Mary is doing this in honor of my sacrifice. She sat at his feet. She knew that the Messiah would come and would live and would suffer and would die and on the third day would rise again. And she was pointing to it. And Jesus, there you don't hear a lot of words. You know what's on his mind, though. This is what's on his mind. She prepared this and sat at my feet in humility and wiped my feet with her hair and worshiped me in all humility because of this, because she knew that I'm giving my life for those who turn to him. Wow. Excuse me, I don't even like doing that. The cloth of a servant. (coughs) turned into a powerful worship tool of the richness of Jesus' sacrifice. 
And Mary doesn't say anything. She just does it. Oh, I wish I could be a worshiper like that. Eye-opening narrative of the delivered from death, coming from Lazarus. Excessive, fragrant expression of sacrifice and devotion. Breathtaking betrayal of Judas. What are you doing, Judas? And then a plot to kill not just one man, but two. The chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well. You see, sin leads to more sin. And lotion leads to more lotion. At one point, one of the leaders said, Jesus needs to die. Because all this commotion and everything, we're going to get more persecuted. So for our nation, Jesus needs to die. One man's death is okay. Is what basically, that was his reasoning. And he started to convince people of that. And maybe one more now, Lazarus, because his testimony is pointing to Jesus. And then maybe one more, Peter, later. And then maybe one more. When sin increased, grace increased all the more. And sin continued to increase this week as people went from Hosanna to crucify him. But Jesus, in all of his loving and mercy and grace, did what he called, what he came to do. What will we do this week? What we, how will we demonstrate that he is worthy of our honor, worthy of our worship? What will we do? Take this sheet. There's some out on the table there. And take each day and look at the scripture. What happened on Palm Sunday? We're doing that today. We worship him. Who do you say? When the crowd all came into Jerusalem, the city was moved, saying, who is this? And they answered Jesus, who is this? They worshiped him. On Monday, he goes into the temple and he clears it. Knocks over tables and stuff because it was in the court of the Gentiles. And he said, this place is meant to be a place of prayer for all people, for all nations. It's not meant to be a place of robbery. And he got intense. Let's pray on Monday that all people here, all nations here, that this message of the gospel goes forth and reaches all people. Tuesday, a lot of, a lot of uh, parables, but a lot of hard stuff. He confronts the Pharisees with hypocrisy. Maybe on Tuesday we spend some time studying his word and, and looking to see if there's any hypocrisy in, in me. Take it and just use it as a tool to sit at his feet to honor him like the example of Mary. And then the last example is the crowd. How are we going to testify with this crowd, celebrate with this crowd? Many of them was just a surface celebration, but for many of them, as we read, uh, I think I read it already in verse 9, uh, 19. No, in verse 17. The crowd that was with them, they had called Lazarus from the tomb, raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. They saw him. They testified to him. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed these signs, went out to meet him. So how are you going to celebrate him? Celebrate the victory that he has given in your life. And so here's Palm Sunday, verse 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come from the festival heard that Jesus was on his way from Jerusalem, coming down now from Bethany, two-mile walk, a two-mile parade. Jesus tells his disciples to go and get a donkey colt, has it all prepared to fulfill prophecy. Anybody that tells you that Jesus never claimed to be a king, don't believe him. It's all over the scripture. And he came and he offered himself as a king. And he comes humbly, not as a warrior, but as a king who deserves anointing and worship. They took palm branches, went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, Lord, save us, rescue us, do what you did in Lazarus in my life today, rescue us. That's why I'm saying one of the reasons why we need to do this is so that we can point other people to the rescuer, to the deliverer. We need to know that there's hope today. A friend of ours that some of you know just got a word last night that he was found dead. I an email late last night. Our friend Joe, some of you know him, Joe Conrad. <coughs> Excuse me. I mean, I've known Joe he was in my, our first youth group. He came to this church for a while. Some of you know him. I don't know. Did he need a call from me? Did he need a text from one of us? Did he, did he need one of us to reach out and say, Hey, Joe, 
Or they do a wellness check and, and he's, he's passed. People need to know that there's a deliverer. People need to know that there's a rescuer. People need to know that when they cry out, Hosanna, Lord, save us, that there's somebody who hears us who hears that cry. And we have that testimony, and we have that life, and we have that victory. So join the crowd, but join them with reality, with authenticity. Don't, be, don't just go through the motions of it. Point somebody to the hope in Jesus Christ. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Psalm 118, blessed, and they add to it, is the king of Israel. Here comes the king, and Jesus offers himself, found the young donkey, sat on it, and said, don't be afraid. Don't be distressed. Don't be anxious anymore. Daughter of, of Zion, daughter of Jerusalem, your king is coming. He's seated on a donkey's colt. Come and worship him. Sing praise to him. Oh, Lord, save us. And their rags, their cloaks, they took off their cloaks, the cloaks that they had walked all the way to Jerusalem in, and they laid them down at the King of kings and the Lord of lords and said, come, Lord Jesus, come and save. And they bowed down, and they stood up, and they worshiped. So the worship team's coming. They're going to sing a song that maybe you don't know. You may just start by sitting, staying seated, and listen to it. And then at a point in the song, when you hear something of the testimony in the song, you might stand up in agreement. You might say, 100. And if you do, I'll throw one of these to you. They say 100 on them. 100. Because I witnessed it. These people witnessed the righteous Redeemer coming on. And the Pharisees were so angry about it. They told them, tell your disciples and tell the children, stop singing, stop waving those. Somebody's going to lose an eye. Stop doing all that. And Jesus said in Luke's account, I'll tell you what, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Don't let no stone take your place today. Stand up and worship him. Honor him. In Matthew's account, he says, have you never read? From the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise. Resurrection witnesses worship freely. Don't worry about what other people are thinking or looking at you. They worship faithfully, serving, and fully devoted, ordained the praise. The prophet Isaiah said, oh, Lord, you're my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name. For in perfect faithfulness, you have done wonderful things, things that you planned from long ago, things that are now being fulfilled. Oh, Lord, you are my God, and I've witnessed it. I don't know what your testimony is. I know my testimony. I was steeped in sin. And he saved me. I know my testimony of 40 years plus in ministry. That he's been faithful. Oh, he's faithful. I've witnessed it. 